video talks, how are folk and roots evolving or is it how, how is folk and roots evolving? Uh, Nathan Moore, our general manager at WTJU and I have been discussing that. This is a community talk organized and hosted by WTJU, the University of Virginia's community radio station on air at 91.1 FM in Charlottesville, Virginia and online at WTJU.net. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. This is part of a series of monthly talks that WTJU has been hosting on the final Friday of each month. However, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, our next talk will actually be on the first Friday in December, and we will explore how classical music becomes more diverse and inclusive. There are quite a few of us on today's Zoom call, so please keep yourself muted during the discussion if you're not part of it. If you have any questions or comments, please type those in the chat window. Our general manager and behind the scenes tech for today, Nathan will be monitoring those throughout the hour. Well, when Nathan approached me about what we could do to talk about folk as part of this session, I had just been astounded at what I had seen so many of my Facebook friends in the music world doing, including my friends, the Wild Ponies, Doug and Talisha Williams. And we're gonna hear from them in a little while about the project that they have undertaken. And then I saw Michaela Ann, one of our guests, had quote had written this on her Facebook page. We are on month eight of this global pandemic. Back in March, touring musicians rapidly saw their entire year of income just wiped out. And we still don't know when they'll get back to work or what the landscape will even look like. And yet everywhere we look, Musicians have not stopped. They are creating, they are donating their time, music, performance, their voices, their platforms to fundraisers, campaigns, to protest, to charity, all while living with the insecurity of their current and future financial livelihood and career. And I, with that, I just had to reach out to Michaela Ann and our other guests. So let me introduce them. First of all, we've got Michaela Ann, who's an incredible singer songwriter in the country world these days, whose, mu whose music, is, uh, well, she's based out of Nashville and she's graced NPR's World Cafe and live sessions, mountain stage radio show, and has headlined a US and EU tour. She has been featured in the New York Times, Refinery29, and NPR's All Things Considered. Layla McCalla is a New York-based, uh, born Haitian American living in New Orleans who sings in French, Haitian Creole, and English, and plays cello, tenor banjo, and guitar deeply influenced by traditional Creole, Cajun, and Haitian music, as well as by American jazz and folk. Her music is at once earthy, elegant, soulful, and witty. It vibrates with three centuries of history, yet also feels strikingly fresh, distinctive, and contemporary. Joe Newberry, I don't know if he's got his hat on or not. I can't tell as I read this, but he's a Missouri <laughs> native and North Carolina transplant who has played music most of his life. His powerful and innovative banjo playing, as well as his songwriting, guitar skills, fiddling and singing has delighted audiences around the world. And finally, Sam Ryder out there in California these days is an American accordionist, pianist, composer and educator, originally trained as a jazz pianist. Sam has spent many years exploring and interpreting folk music from around the world on the accordion. You can catch him playing with some great jazz and bluegrass acts when he's back in New York as the human hands. And as I said, we're gonna have a video from Doug and Talisha Williams known as the Wild Ponies as a way of kicking off what folk music and artists are doing to evolve and explore the world in this pandemic. So Nathan, if you'll play that for us. Hey y'all, we're Doug and Talisha from the band Wild Ponies, and we are here in our house, Rainbow Terrace. We're outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And speaking of Rainbow Terrace. We do have, a, we're working on a new record. Uh, we are still musicians, believe it or not, in spite of the pandemic. We are working on a new record. I think it's the best thing we've ever done, really. Uh, it's three songs. We're going to record it right here at the house. But yeah. In the meantime, we're until we're able to get ourselves back on the road, our pandemic pivot plan is... I'm making a food, a food, food truck. truck. <laughs> it's a cool thing. It's in our backyard right now. It's the, the light's kind of shining on us when we get over here. Uh, it's Dreamers Food Truck. Dreamers. Pizza right and bowls for creative souls. 
we kind of started it with our, our housemate, Laura Schneider. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a cool thing. We're going to be serving food around Nashville, some of the venues that are, that are not having shows right now and some parking lots. And we've got this great idea. We're doing these creativity prompts. So if you show up and you order your food, we're going to give you a creativity prompt and you can go um, write a song or a poem or make a dance or like a cocktail. We're just trying to find ways to stay engaged with our community, you know, during the pandemic and to continue to create. And so this is something that we found that we, we love and, and we're really excited about it. We love the logo. We love the way the, the truck came out. We love creating delicious food. We do. <laughs> the truck, the trailer's called Red and the truck over here behind us is called Dot. And she's beautiful too. And yeah, that's, that's basically what we're doing. We're also training to become Motorcycle Safety Foundation rider coaches. Which is why we can't is, be right there right now. Yeah, we're training right now. That's why we're training in a video. But <laughs> man, we should love you guys there in Charlottesville. And TJ, has been so good to us. And Peter, we appreciate you. Um, but yeah, I think in a short, short version, that's what we've got. Keep creating. Keep creating. That's do the it. thing. Keep creating. Keep creating. Don't stop. That's what we're going to do. Love y'all. So as I said, that they were one of the uh, ideas behind this, just this food truck that they're doing to, uh, and you know, going to venues that are now closed just to keep, you know, I think they're gonna have some music down the road as well, outdoors so folks can come by and hear that as well. So that, that kind of helped give me the idea. And then Michaela, see, seeing as I read your quote, why don't we get you to come in here for a minute and talk about what has inspired you? Oh man. Okay. Well, it's been, I think probably everybody feels this way, but it's been such a roller coaster of, of eight months of, um, I don't know, I go in waves of feeling immense grief for what we've lost. And I'm, but every time I start to feel sad for myself about like what I was supposed to be doing this year and all the good things that were supposed to be happening um, and experiences I was supposed to be having. Every time I feel bad for myself, um, I, it kind of turns off really quick because literally everyone is in the same boat. Um, but it has really renewed my, my feeling of just how incredible artists are because everyone is incredibly adaptable. And I don't, you know, even people who are switching gears or making different plans, um, I don't know, there's just an incredible spirit of, again, community-based music as well, of how to stay engaged with communities. And I think, especially in folk music, as we were kind of briefly talking before it started, of kind of folk and roots music being especially acoustic-based, um, community-based, people-based, to have that, it's one thing that we had our like our work taken away and our income and our tours, but also just the aspect of our our people that we don't get to see the audiences we night after night, like just emotionally and spiritually. That's a crazy thing to go from traveling the world and being with people 24-7, whether it's the people you travel with or an, a different audience every night, um, to not having much contact is really, it's startling. Um, so I've just been really impressed with looking at all the different ways people have been still figuring out how to engage musically, creatively, and virtually, obviously. Um, so I keep, it's been as hard as this has been, it's also been a, a wonderful year of gifts for me of the time it's given me to create um, that I probably wouldn't have had if I'd been on tour all year long. Um, so there's still like a lot that I keep looking at to be grateful for and and just really inspired by what I see when I look on Facebook and Instagram and what all of my friends and people are doing in the community of music. That's, that's larger than just the people I know. Well, Sam, you uh, took the time to go back out to California and you were already composing these incredible pieces with the human hands, but now you're taking it even to the academic level. I think you're getting your master's, aren't you? That's right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I actually, I chose to move out to California um, last year. We moved in December, so pre-pandemic. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm, my wife and I are both from San Francisco. So for us, it was a move home after living in New York for 14 years. 
Um, and uh, it was bittersweet, of course. Um, and my plan was to continue to tour with the band this year um, and to see everybody, like Michaela was saying, you know, every couple of weeks when we would have a tour somewhere. Um, but obviously that's changed. And so um, I had actually already been thinking of going back to school, um, but this really carved out the time for me. Um, and I'm, a, I'm definitely an introvert. Um, so, you know, my friend to, um, to this was sort of like, wow, I really have some time now to do a lot of the things that I really like to do, like read and write music and um, have a routine. Um, and so in some ways it's really fitting well into my life. You know, I'm like, I'm diving really deep into the thing about music that I don't totally understand, which is that whole European Western classical musician, uh, like tradition. Um, it's not where I come from. Um, I'm really coming at music more from a jazz and folk background, but it's been really, um, wonderful to be a beginner um and to come at it from a beginner's mindset well didn't i see you recently i i love scandinavian music and over there it's fairly common for the accordion to perform with a classical ensemble and didn't i see you recently do that uh not with a classical ensemble but i did do a, a live stream um playing some bach for the berkeley symphony a couple weeks ago okay. just solo on the accordion um gotcha. which is so not my thing it was a giant challenge it took me a month of practice to work up one invention and one corral um, and there are many many um, classical accordion virtuosos out there that um, play stuff like that they eat it for breakfast um, but uh, it was a great it was a great experience for me but anyways I was just going to say that um, you know at, it's great it's great to be in school and it's great to be um, have this time as an introvert to do these things that I love but I also really deeply miss my com my community and I think especially as an introvert we really need um, to be forced out of our caves and to be in um, proximity to others and for me the, the the gigs is like and the community really is that thing that gets me out of the house to do that stuff so um, it's it's a it's a delicate balance and um, you know, stuff like this is actually really wonderful because um, it's really nice to hear other people, other musicians talking about how they're experiencing the same thing. So uh, thanks for having me on the program. Cool. Layla, did, had you already planned on reissuing your album this year, which for those who don't know, it's Very Colored Songs, a tribute to Langston Hughes that just came out recently on Smithsonian Folkways, or was that something that, that came about once the pandemic kicked in? I think that it was something that was, um, I, I kind of, you know, the pandemic happening kind of blew all of my memory of <laughs> what was happening pre-pandemic in terms of planning out of my mind. But I, I seem to recall um, that uh, we were in talks with Smithsonian Folkways about uh, reissuing the album. They were, they've, were really excited about it, um, you know, and it, it kind of came down to a, a business decision in, in some ways. Um, the, um, you know, just the, they had the funding to be able to uh, acquire the album and it wasn't guaranteed for 2021. And, you know, I, I really have been in talks with them for, you know, a couple of years. Um, and there's been interest in in having the this album that I, I created that was my first record and um, was released in tribute to Langston Hughes be part of their African American um, collection and and so you know for me it was like I I, I did a lot of <clears throat> sort of deliberating about whether this was the right thing and then finally decided that yes you know I think it will be the right thing and. You know, and now um, it's interesting how, yeah, you know, I, I always love that quote, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans, that John Lennon quote, because I feel like it summarizes exactly, um, you know, how things have unfolded this year. It's just like, there's been so much that we can't control. And, um, and at the same time, there's been this like, 
you know, um, mainstreamization, <laughs> if I can make up a word for this, um, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, the, a, a lot of the issues that I'm sort of grappling with on the record are things that our society are, are still grappling with. And, um, and so for me, it's been an incredible opportunity and an honor to just uh, be able to continue to talk about these songs um, that I, I always knew that they'd be relevant, but I didn't, I couldn't have planned how poignant the, the timing of this album release would have been. So um, yeah, it's been um, like Michaela uh, mentioned, it's been a roller coaster. And some days it's so exhausting and then other days it's, it's exhilarating. It's like, okay, things are actually working. This is, I don't even know how this is happening, but something is working. Um, and then other days it's just like, oh my God, I'm tired. I'm tired of the pandemic. I'm tired of, you know, not knowing when I can get back out on the road. I'm tired of, you know, not, not feeling safe anywhere. Yeah, it's a real, um, you know, I've been kind of trying to adopt like a sort of harm reduction model of, of how to adapt during these times because, you know, there's just no black and white decisions. I have three kids at home that I'm trying to take care of. I recently separated from my husband. I've had a lot of, of people in my personal life. And so, and then the world is also in complete upheaval. So it's just been um, an overwhelmingly transformational time. That's the title of my next record. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Announced here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and Joe, you know, I, I've actually seen you hit the road a little bit. So uh, what, what has it been like for you? Um, I was saying before we, we got started that I played, um, I, and they're probably my last shows for the year, but I played two outdoor shows, one in Charlottesville a couple of weeks ago, and then the, uh, the next day down in Fort Mill, South Carolina. The uh, it, the Charlottesville show was a porch show. I, I stood on the porch. Um, folks were in their little bubbles, six feet apart. Um, it it was as exciting as if I was playing Carnegie Hall. It, <laughs> I just I I had missed it so much, and um, um, I I made it where um, I did everything as much as I could um, paperless. And had if folks wanted to do, I signed a bunch of CDs uh, pre pre signed, and if, if folks wanted a CD, they I just asked them to PayPal me, and if they if they didn't have a PayPal account, I said when you get home, send me a check, um, and uh, and we'll do it that way because I want to still live in a world where I can send somebody home with a CD and they'll send me a check later on, and and everybody came through. It was great. I have not been. Um, I, you know, somebody said that Shakespeare wrote some of his greatest um, work during his plague time, and it's like, oh, thanks, thanks so much for, for no pressure there. But I, um, uh, I got off the road and I started thinking. For some reason, I thought I don't know how long I'm going to be home, so I started thinking of Roger Miller, because he was king of the road, and so I decided that I was king of the home. And so I, the, my first little bit of creativity was if you, if you hear Roger's um, groove in your head, my money's all but spent. I'm down to my last 50 cents. I'm on the internet. It's hard to quit like cigarettes, but shows from my living room pay better than pushing broom. I'm a man of streams and more streams. I'm king of the home. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, I, ha, I got, had fun with it. I even, you know, my, my third broadcast was sort of lame, but seen way up in Bangor, Maine. I wear pants, but I don't wear shoes. You can't see them, so what's the use of an old fogey sort of sound? I'm known for that the world around. So, and, and, and I got to modulate and the whole thing. But that opened the door where I could be a little creative, but mostly... And I wanted to ask everybody else, I mean, how is your how is your technology going? Because that's been really that's been really my thing that I've been working on is making sure that my signal and my picture uh, got a little ring light. How, how are y'all doing 
on, on technology to, to get what you do out. Someone? Someone? I mean, the, the first thing, the first thing that I bought was a, um, a tripod. Um, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> um, the first thing I bought was the tripod and, um, you know, uh, that, that seemed to be like the key to the, the absolute most basic piece of equipment that I needed. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would have these issues with lighting and sound you know, um, and so <laughs> then I um, did a gig where they sent me a Shure microphone that plugs into my phone that I can do a live stream from. This is uh, this is the little microphone, and that was the beginning of like you know a a, a better sound situation. <laughs> and then um, I ended up I did buy one of those ring light tripods, um, and that's been that's been really helpful, you know, um, because then like, you know, I was using all natural light and then the sun would be setting and I would just fade into the background, <laughs> whatever, you know, <laughs> and just be like, oh, get off, get off my live stream. Just like, God, I'm just like you doing this for the skin in my teeth, stuff. you know? <laughs> so it, it, it has taken quite, you know, I did a, a gig for Virginia Tech where they sent me a lot of gear and it was stressful. I was like, oh my God. Like at first it was really exciting. Then I was like, I'm not a sound person. This is my daughter, Delilah. Hey, Delilah. Hi, Delilah. <laughs> Wanting That's attention, right. wants to be part of the conversation. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's just been, it's just been a trip. It's just been a trip. I feel like I'm still figuring it out because there's a part of you that just wants to fight it and wants to believe, oh, I'm not going to need this stuff. And, you know, I'm going to figure out another way or I'm going to get back out on the road soon. So I kind of feel like I, I have that internal conflict where I'm like, I, I just, you know, I don't know if I want to go so deep into understanding how to make good sound, you know, how will I, how will I be useful um, as a live performer if I, if I get too good at live streaming? And I, I hate live streaming. I mean, I do it, and every time I feel like sort of relieved, but the the anxiety before the show is pretty intense, you know. And I'm I'm not someone who was very shy about getting on stage. I always loved that, you know. Michaela, so, what yeah, it's well, been interesting. I was asking if Joe and Layla, it sounds like they endorsed the ring light because I was saying earlier that I hadn't yet decided if I should buy one because I'm doing what Layla said, I'm resisting buying the equipment. But I did buy an interface um, and got, you know, software to do higher quality sound for Facebook live streams. And then for Instagram live streams, I did get an iPhone 11. So, which has been helpful. And I haven't for the last couple of months, but for the several months, I was doing a weekly live stream and raising money. I was donating to a different charity each week um, and asking for donations and each charity, I would talk about it. And that was mentally and emotionally helpful for me because I spent the week researching the charity and finding different charities that had some type of personal connection. Um, and that was all kind of inspired because early on, I had a, a fan of mine pass away from COVID-19 um, in March, it was right at the beginning. Um, so the first charity live stream I did was for him um, and his wife because they had a found, they had just launched a foundation for young adults with, also, uh, with autism because he has a 22 year old son who has severe autism. Um, so that was what kind of launched my foray into live streaming. And it is really interesting to me, just like kind of on a psychological, sociological aspect, because in some ways you feel really separated from, from your audience and, you know, people aren't clapping, you're not getting like that kind of engagement, but at the same time, there, 
they can comment. So in a weird way, like when I was really in the midst of doing a weekly live stream, I felt like I was getting to know fans even better because I would interact with the chat. Um, and again, because the first live stream was for my the fan of mine who had passed away, it was really emotional. So I kind of, I cried openly, which I was not planning or expecting to do, but it was the beginning of quarantine. He died of COVID. It was really traumatic. And it kind of, in this way, it was so weird to be isolated in your home and just connecting over the computer, but in some ways feeling a deeper connection with these with strangers just through, you know, like Layla mentioned earlier, that, that feeling of like, oh my God, I didn't mean to reveal myself that much. Like I've never openly cried on stage in a performance and would probably feel very uncomfortable um, no matter what the context is. And this was a really different, unique, interesting experience, which I feel like bonded me with, with people in a way that I probably wouldn't have. So okay. there's this weird dynamic of like separation, but also kind of enhanced vulnerability and connection through our screens. Well, Sam, you obviously want to, you are in California and you've been focusing more on your studies, but in you, how is it for you doing these streaming performances? Yeah, um, I've done a few since the beginning, maybe one every other month or so. Um, the thing that's been a challenge is as a pianist, um, that presents some technical difficulties, um, both in terms of sound and um, choreography that are different if you're playing a guitar or mandolin or even the accordion. And I've had to set up my phone so that it can sort of capture me when I'm sitting sideways playing the piano and then when I turn around to play the accordion and and also the acoustic piano is, you know, I have, I have mics and I have an interface and everything, but, um, there's just always an issue. And, and, you know, uh, I, my parents have a beautiful grand piano, but of course it's sitting right in front of a great window where you can look out on the street while you're practicing. Well, it turns out that windows don't make for very good backdrops when you're trying to do a live stream. So that's been an issue. I sort of feel like there's a, for me, one of the things I value so much about live performance from the audience um, and the impromptu nature of it is just the interaction with um, my friends on stage. That is the thing that keeps me from being terrified most of the time. A lot of times people come to me afterwards and they, after I do a show and they say, oh, you look so happy the whole time. You just have the biggest smile. You just look fearless. And I always say, well, I'm just smiling to prevent myself from being terrified. <laughs> um, and definitely smiling at the other musicians on stage is usually one of the things that really gets me out of my own head and allows me to improvise freely. I, uh, I, I will say personally, having seen Sam up there on stage with his with the other acts, they all have those smiles because they, they're always watching to see what the other is going to do next. And and uh, it's, it's nice to learn why you had that smile going on, because yeah. for me, it's just watching all of you up on stage because you each seem to be improvising as you go along, you know, to your composed pieces. But still, it's wonderful just because you're all enjoying each other's company up there. Yeah, that's a, that's such a big part of it for me. And I just don't know if that's really going to be replaced with Zoom. Um, I had a lot of people at first asking me if I was going to be making a bunch making more videos with the band or trying to get people together to do live streams. And my answer has kind of been more hopeful that um, we're going to wait this one out. And when it's time to perform together in person again, it will be a really wonderful day. Um, but for me, technology honestly has been useful mostly for teaching. Um, I've been lucky to get a bunch of new students. Um, been teaching a lot about composition and um, piano and um, accordion and um, having my a tripod where I can put my phone above a keyboard so people can see my hands while I'm, you know, playing. It's really been making me a much better teacher, actually, because um, it's uh, I've been learning the value of of um, demonstrating things without talking too much, just playing and letting people um, play back to me which is a powerful way of teaching that, um, I don't know, it's not, maybe it's not very academic, but it's really great. And for some reason, this particular 
form of Zoom lessons has really been, it's been going in that direction and I've been really digging that. Um, so that's kind of my main use of technology um, other than, um, oh, and also um, that concert that you mentioned uh, for the Berkeley Symphony, one thing I valued about that was actually it was pre-recorded. So um, like Layla said, I've been finding a lot of anxiety, like pre-show anxiety and doing a live stream, but something about, they gave me an assignment of some pieces to learn and perform. And so I got to practice them for a month and then I spent an afternoon, I set up my room the way that it looked good and I recorded videos of those songs. And that, like a very rewarding experience for me as a performer because it meant that I got to kind of like study this thing. It was like a challenge. And then, um, and then I made a product that I actually really felt proud of afterwards. And I was excited for them to share it um, as opposed to sometimes I get on and do a live stream and it doesn't go that well. And I'm just like, Oh no, what have I put into the world? It's now it's living on Facebook. I don't even own it. I don't know. So um, I, I valued that way of doing it. And I may, you try to do more of that in the future because um, at least then I felt like I had some creative control. Well, I was chatting yesterday on W2J with Jerry Douglas, who's here in Charlottesville for a concert tonight. And he was saying uh, for him, he had been on the road for 50 years. And so at first he was relishing the chance to be off the road. Not, not, he wasn't happy about the reason for it, but it allowed him to actually withdraw and re recharge his batteries and find some new creative things he could do while he was off the road and he's been doing a lot of recording for others in his own studio. Now, of course, you know, Jerry Douglas is Jerry Douglas, you know, 14 time Grammy winner where everyone wants to record with him. But I'm curious, have any of you taken that time to be able to, I, I know Michaela, you, you said earlier that you're recording a new album right now, but are, are you finding new and more creative ways recording uh, during the pandemic when you're not going to an actual studio or? Are you, are you recording at home and then sending it to the others or how does that work? I've done both. Go I've ahead. actually gone, uh, it was a, a big, a big room at, at a studio and they had mic protocols. They set up, no one else had used that mic. I said that there was nobody in the room. It, the engineer was in the other room. And then I, then I left like the fog rolling out the bay, I just went like, see ya, and left. And then I've also done, um, I've also done sound files and sent, just, you know, listen to the click track in my, in my earbuds and, and recorded that way. Mikhail, how about you? Yeah, we're doing, um, it's interesting because my, um, my husband is a drummer and producer and engineer, and we've been together for, uh, like 13 years and we've never worked we've worked together a lot but we've never co-produced and, and recorded and done a project together um, and it's I think it's taken 13 years for us to get to a place where we could do that <laughs> um, and this pandemic has really that wasn't really the plan until the pandemic hit and we were like well we have a studio in the basement like we have all the time if we get into arguments and we need to stop for the day, that's fine. <laughs> so um, it's been a really incredible experience for us to work together and not have that pressure of, man, we have to get this record done in this amount of time because we have to get back on the road and we're at home and we can work through all of what it means to be a husband and a wife making music together. Um, and then we have brought in you know, it, we had a guitarist over the other day and we're recording together. And then I, you know, I have a bass player friend in New York who flew in the parts and I was running upstairs stairs to FaceTime with him to like talk through the song. And so we've done a mix of, we did a, a tedious like tracking in one instrument at a time um, and then had some people fly in parts. So it's been a, it's been a mix, which is, is rewarding in a different way than having everybody in the room at one time playing all together. There's there's pros and cons to both, I think, but in some ways it's opened up possibilities because I'm like, everybody's going from home, so I don't, I can ask whoever I want to play on this, so. Yep. Layla? You're muted. 
stuff. Yeah. Um, I just have kids and dogs and lots of stuff happening in the background. I don't want to be distracting. Um, I, um, I'm actually getting ready to record my fourth album and, um, I'm actually flying to a studio in LA and, you know, with a, with a, a small group of people, um, that I've already been somewhat, you know, potted up with, um, we are, we're going to go and record and we're, we're getting ready to play my first drive-in show. Wow. It's like, I don't know what the heck that's going to be like, but I'm, I know I'm never going to forget that. Um, but, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of, um, excited for all of those experiences. Um, just very curious what, um, what it'll feel like. And, you know, I've got some N95 masks that I'm going to be flying with my daughter's back and, um, yeah, uh, it'll feel, you know, the world is just so different. It just is. So even, you know, even if you're doing things in a way that is kind of how you planned on doing them, you know, my original idea was to record this, this next record of mine in Haiti, which is like completely not an option now. Yeah. Um, and it, it actually has elongated the timeline because I was going to, I was planning originally on recording this past June. And now I'm just, uh, you know, I'm I'm grateful that I've had the extra time to really think more thoughtfully about the work that I'm going to be doing and, you know, the statement that I want to be making, the performances that I actually want to capture, you know. Um, there's uh, a Haitian percussionist that I really wanted to have live on the record, and then that's not going to be possible. So that, you know, there's some things that you just have to surrender to, I think, these days. And you know, I'm trying to find the, the, the grace and the, the flow with all of that, you know, because it just is nothing, otherwise nothing gets done. And on top of that, I realize I'm just so lucky to be able to do this. Um, you know, I think the biggest takeaway for me during this time has been like, wow, my career is sustainable if I'm, if I'm willing to adapt. I don't know if, if that runs out in 2021, though, is the question. <laughs> you know, how long can we just be these adaptable people? We already live in a super capitalist society that gives us such limited resources for our lives. And, you know, self-employed people get taxed the most. So, you know, I don't want to go too far down that road. But, you know, we're already kind of uh, a marginalized group of people economically. Um, and then to be like, you know adapting you know there i i always um there's a, a facebook group called um like uh it's something it's something like you know um feel good stories that are actually like just revealing of how capitalist our society is or something like that <laughs> um and uh i kind of feel like you know torn between are we living through that or are things going to change for the better you know because i think that this What's happening is that this whole thing is pointing to these bigger issues. Like, you know, uh, for example, the airlines, you know, before it was like, oh, we have to charge you all the bags. There's all these change fees. The rules are strict. We can't be flexible. Sorry, that's how it is. All of a sudden, a pandemic hits. No change fees. Everyone gets two free bags. <laughs> Come back. Come back. We're losing money. You know, so I'm just like, you know, it just feels like it, it, it's, you know, I wish it wasn't like this, but it does take some some big um, changes, you know, for the that the world is going through to to kind of be reborn. I don't know. I, you know, what's scary is that we don't know what we're being reborn as. I resolved early on that however it gets away from me, I'm going to chase it gracefully. I know it will. I know it will get away from me. Um, but I'm going to do as good a job chasing it down as I can. Um, and I know if you look at, uh, if you take, for instance, like the moon, the race to, to land a, a human being on the moon, there was that and there was all the stuff that came out of that. Right. 
And so if we can use this, and I, I really do feel that going forward, our shows and our, and our performing life, and certainly for a venue, you know, I think that their f venues are going to start including live streams of shows or, or, or some live streams because, you know, uh, I look at folks on this, on this zoom session and I've got, you know, friends from UK, I've got friends from France here and it, that's opening up our world in a really cool and meaningful way. Um, and so I'm, I, Lela, I'm I'm like you. I I don't know what's going to happen, but I but I do know that that we've got we've got a chance to to make the world uh, slightly closer to us. Absolutely, I think also you know people will gather again. We just don't know when. You know that's what's kind of been killing me. It's like people have been gathering since the beginning of time, and we need that. We need that. And so it's, you know, I'm just like, how long, how long can we go without the, the capacity that we're used to? Like, do we wear masks forever now? Are singers really super spreaders? <laughs> you know, like all these questions. I'm just like, oh God. Well, something that I've been intrigued by and impressed is as the artists have been at home, you know, in, in the folk world, of course, sharing one's political and personal beliefs has always been part of it. But, you know, when you look at the roots, you know, with bluegrass and country, artists are taking the time now, and maybe they were doing it at their concerts, but they're actually expressing their, their feelings online. And Ivan Rosenberg, he's another one of my inspirations, an incredible dobro player from originally from Oregon, living up in Toronto now, who has helped head up during the election trying to get expats to get out there and and he's pretty much given up his musical career and he's following all these political campaigns around the united states and helping folks know where they might have a shot of improving the the, the person who's in office and so t just taking that time to be more aware of what's there and helping others become and i've made donations to certain campaigns. And so it, it's been great to see the artist, you know, like David Grisman, who, who's definitely in that bluegrass world, you know, came out and made a statement that upset a lot of folks or, uh, and folks in the country world who have just stepped out and upset a lot of their fans, but they said, hey, you know, we're in this together and we need to talk about why it's important. Uh, Ken, uh, what's this, uh, this young country act who came out and did this wonderful three or four minute introduction. I wish I just forgot his name. Tyler Childers. Tyler Childers, you know, and he spent the time explaining, thank you, Joe, uh, why he was making that statement. And, and it, it caught on. And I, so for me, it's been great to see artists be able to take that time and not just do it from concert to concert, but actually put that out there and, and share. And I, I'm just curious how, how you all feel about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Michaela, you want to go? Uh, I, you can go first, Layla. So I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt like we were both... Uh, uh. <laughs> um, I can feel it even through Zoom. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have a lot of my career, I've been talking very openly about my, my political positions. And I think that what's happening is that... Um, we are collectively reckoning with the choices that we've made with our own complicity in creating these um, issues that we're grappling with, you know, that our, our, our families have grappled with for generations, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, those issues that I'm speaking to are, you know, this rampant inequality that we have in our society, um, the policing of, of black and brown bodies, um, uh, the disappearance of um, indigenous women, you know, the uh, unacknowledgement by our government of um, all genders. Um, I think we're having a look in the mirror and say, who are we? Who are we? You know, um, in a way that our generation has certainly not faced. And 
you know, I, I don't even know if um, previous generations have faced this in, in such an intense way of, uh, you know, uh, not being able to actually gather. And then, you know, and then you see actually uh, there are big protests that have happened and everyone goes and is wearing a mask and, you know, transmission rates are extremely, extremely low, negligent, you know, and then you see a political rally where, you know, people aren't wearing uh, basic PPE and, um, and we're seeing very high transmission rates. I mean, we even had like a mini, um, mini outbreak in the, in the White House. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. Um, and so we have to look at ourselves differently. We have to recognize our participation in our society in a way um, that I don't think we've had to think about. And especially as musicians, you know, we keep our, our nose to the ground and just do the work. Um, and that's kind of been our MO. And now I'm realizing actually the work doesn't get done unless my community is okay, unless people are okay, unless people's basic needs are being met. You know, I, I've been horrified to see um, how hard it is for the, the city waste union here in New Orleans, the people who are collecting our garbage, that how hard it is for them to fight for a fair wage and, you know, protective equipment for this, for the job that they do. Um, you know, and it's like, we, we have to support them. We have to um, recognize the work. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I was literally nearly in tears every time I went to the grocery store, just like thanking the people at the checkout counter. And I found myself so emotional, like at Costco, like <laughs> checking out, just like, thank you so much for being here for us. Like I have never, realize you know the position that you are essential you are essential you know and i think we've always thought of ourselves as so self-important you know and so it's it's been a very um it's been a very humbling time and yeah i i just keep on going back to that overwhelmingly transformational in ways that are were necessary and are necessary and will continue to be necessary and then in other ways that are extremely heartbreaking because we just realize, you know, we don't live in a country that um, that values human life as much as it, we say we do. That's been really heartbreaking to me. Michaela? Yeah, I think um, I've always found it really inter interesting, the sentiment of the pushback of like not wanting artists and musicians to speak out politically. Um, because, I mean, artists are feelers and thinkers and contemplating humanity and what's going on in the world, um, philosophizing and all that stuff. So I've never understood that kind of the tension of some people not wanting their favorite musicians to say, speak their mind. Um, but I've, I, I get that. I think this brings up a broader idea of we need to be better at having respectful discourse and having conversation and realizing that we can disagree um, and still try and find some common ground and have have conversation about stuff. Um, so that's kind of been at the forefront for me. And there are just kind of non-negotiables that when people say, I don't want to talk about politics, you know, Black Lives Matter and civil rights, and those aren't politics. That's being a kind person and and a just person um so to me i've kind of been sitting back watching this and thinking so much about one how devastating it is that nothing has changed and in a way the pandemic has been this perfect context to to get people who haven't been aware um to finally see the stuff that's been going on for a long time that is not anything new um, but the resistance to me is confusing because my thought is if you're sitting back and being told by people that this is the reality for them, this is something that happens and you don't experience it, wh why do you think that your reality is the truth rather than listening and saying, okay, this is what's happening. I didn't know. Um, any progress in life has happened because people have fought for it. 
who've had to convince those who aren't experiencing it that it's real. The only way that women have the right to vote um, anything has been because um, people have said, hey, this is messed up to the people in power who don't experience it. So I think it's just thankfully come to the forefront because people have had the space and time to become more involved and aware, even if they cared before, but maybe it's just more prevalent right now because people aren't running around and, you know, living our daily lives where we're so consumed. And I, I've been really heartened to see living in Nashville, the community, because I lived in New York City for a long time. And my background is I have a jazz degree from the new school. I also have a degree in sociology and studied social movements and civil rights movement. And moving to Nashville, one of my challenges was coming from a very diverse community, um, musically, artistically, ethnically, racially, um, to East Nashville kind of hipster Americana country world um, and feeling that kind of um, homogeneity and feeling like a little bit of a struggle with that. And I've been really, really heartened to see the community here in Nashville of musicians really stepping up and just all very activist minded and wanting to speak out and wanting to um, build and promote diversity in a more equitable uh, music community. And I think that's gonna be a positive of this year that I hope sustains and, and continues on past this kind of um, energetic time. Joe, Sam? Yeah. Sam. Um, I, uh, like you said, I, I uh, started a, a degree this year at a, um, a master's degree at a state school here in California um, that um, was in the midst of its own um, grappling with DEI issues and um, Black Lives Matter really spurred a lot of new conversation um, and also um, some really interesting and controversial um, uh, videos and articles that have been published in the last year about white supremacy and the white racial frame of uh, music theory and the way that music is taught in school. These have been very powerful um, sort of ideas that have been percolating through the music world and the music education world. Um, and I'm actually, I'm writing a paper right now for my, one of my introductory class um, to grad studies classes of just about asking what um, the, cor the corollary question to, you know, how can we make music education more equitable and inclusive um, is how can we as musicians and music educators contribute to um, larger conversations about diversity and equity. And I think the folk world has this is something that um, the folk world has embraced from the very very beginning um but that a lot of other um a lot of other communities in uh, the music world have not and um i think there's a lot to be learned um and personally what i've been trying to practice um and learn more about is just listening um especially as a white man spending more time um listening and not formulating my responses right away. And um, it's been challenging, especially as an artist, you know, we're taught to create and to put stuff out there. We're also supposed to be taught to listen and everyone always talks about how important listening is. But um, I've really started to realize this year how far I have to go with listening and how I'm sort of one of the crucial things that artists have to contribute to the world is um, practicing listening with Eddie. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do right now. Well, so, you know, a, a year ago, there was this fellow by the name of Roland Wiggins who taught John Coltrane and Monk and uh, Quincy Jones and so many others. You know, he African-American himself, and there's a whole wing dedicated to him at a uh, school up in Massachusetts, a college. And, you know, he was he came up with this atonal theory, which just breaks all the, you know, in Western theory, you know, it's, it's, it's a way that white man taught, you know, coming from Europe and, and he's just taught. And it's, it was amazing just to have the chance a year ago to hear him start to discuss that. And then of course you, you mentioned that, that piece that went viral about what music theory is and, 
And so it, it's it's wonderful now that that is coming to light. I think, Joe, I don't want I don't want to step on your toes. Uh, you know, I'm not wearing shoes, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, I think you know I think about this a lot. I think about how I can be an ally. I th I think a lot about how I can take all of the the privilege that's accorded to me that I've you know I've never even thought much about and try and change th that dynamic and and that paradigm a little bit and and I agree with Sam to do a lot more listening. I am I do not usually at at a regular show I don't proselytize religion or politics. I try and uh, think about the idea that a sermon lived is better than a sermon preached. And if I can model decent human behavior, that's a good start. That said, there is a reason that Woody Guthrie had this machine kills fascists on his guitar. And that's a good thing for me to remember. So I, uh, but, but uh, in, I've, uh, I've taken a little bit of uh, smack from folks because I've been, I've been doing a lot of work uh, for the Democratic Party uh, online campaign events and uh, and doing um, playing for folks um, around the country now, in North Carolina, but but around the country trying to trying to um, get those folks elected. Um, oh, and the other one other thing I wanted to come come back to is that you know this whole notion of feeling like you're talking to your screen. The first political event that I did. The candidate left her mic open, and as I was playing, she was going, "Mm-hmm, mm-hmm," and I and and I said, "Oh yes, please keep your mic open for the rest of the show." So we had that connection. It's like, uh, and the the way that that I like doing it is having somebody watch the chat for me and then tell me. So I'm interacting with somebody, or they're sending me messages, of, uh, you know, when I when I'm doing requests. Well, it's been wonderful uh, as everyone's lining up to vote, how mu musicians, and it's gone across the country, they're signing up to take turns to go out and perform for folks. And a, a lot of young folks who for the first time are voting as well. And it, it's, and the, the musicians I know are coming back enriched because one, they're performing for audiences <laughs> up close and personal, but two, it's, they're, 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 they're seeing democracy in action and, uh, and being part of it. And you know, we, we've reached that one hour mark and I wanna thank you for being part of this conversation. And thank I, you, I hope others will continue it offline. And I just wanna thank you again. What an Michaela, honor. I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. Honor to be with you, uh, Michaela and Sam and Layla. So when this is, when we're through this, could we have a tune or two? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Four notes, but they're good notes, and so <laughs> I believe <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. So go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Sue Chase did write a question in the chat. If people want to answer later, just I didn't want her to feel ignored. <laughs> so she asked us what what sustains us besides music through this time. So if we want to just write her or whatever, I just didn't want her to feel. Well, I cooking. Yeah. <laughs> Baking? Good food, cooking, yeah. uh, be, cooking be, and baking, be, being outside. Um, by the way, folks, I um, I'm trying to you, you try to not uh, zoom splain or tune splain. <laughs> um, but if you want to save the chat, go down in the chat to the three little dots and say you'll it'll save your chat, and that way the questions won't go away. But you know, I I never want to be a zoom splainer. Oh God! <laughs> uh, my apologies to Sue for not well uh, put. Well one. put, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there was another uh, great comment which um, uh, Maria also left.